What's up, everybody? I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the Mike Dolce Show. Today, we are talking to Mr. Jason Phillips. Jason Phillips is the founder of the Nutritional Coaching Institute, and he's working now to help coach coaches in leading a revolution of evidence-based science with regards to health fitness and optimizing performance so i'm gonna let jason tell you all that he's up to here let, let's get him on board jason what's up my man what's up brother it's good to be here man how are you it's good it's good to see you you know face to face we did a little bit of a yeah, instagram man. you know dming and, and texting like that but it is nice to have a chat with you it's been a minute man it's uh it's always good to catch up man i know we're, we're finally on the same side of the country and uh right so yeah man it's, it's always good so where are you right now where's home base Right now, I'm in South Carolina. I'm actually visiting my parents. My dad's ill, so I'm down here. But home now is okay. D.C. for me, so Northern Virginia, D.C. area. Oh, wow. Okay. You yeah. know, kind of chaos up there, up near the Beltway, right, as they say. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I stay outside of that as much as I thought. I'm out in the suburbs. I'm out in, like, Loudoun County, Virginia. But uh, it's, okay. uh, yeah, man, it, it is definitely a lot of chaos in the D.C. area. So, and you don't get caught up in all the all the traffic, all the chaos, all the... The political BS, I'm, right? I'm close enough to Dulles Airport that I, you know, I get there, I get out, um, I, I get to stay out of the city. I kind of get to do my own thing, man. Anybody that knows me knows I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty much a homebody. So I just, I actually just got a new house and just putting that together to make it my sanctuary, man, and do my work and and hang out and enjoy life, bro. Awesome, hell yeah, that's what it's about. So what I wanted to do, I I want to get down and dirty in nutrition. Obviously, that that is your expertise. But before that, I just want to get a little bit of background on you, so the audience can better understand you, where you're coming from, and I think our our backstory really does shape what we do today. And that's that's what we find out. So let's go all the way back. Where where were you born? Where was your origin? Yeah, man. Um, I, I was born in Washington State, um, oh, wow. but I, I lay no claims to Washington at all. I was out before I turned one. Um, I actually grew up in my hometown, so in in Northern Virginia, um, okay. born and or, you know raised there. Um, I've been everywhere since, bro. Um, you know, I graduated high school. I moved down to Florida to go to school. I I went out west. I came back to the East Coast. Did Charlotte. Did Florida. Um, did Arizona. Um, and so now I'm kind of bi-coastal, man. We just closed on the new Virginia house and we're getting ready to, to close on the property. I'm either going to do Vegas or, or Arizona. So I haven't decided which, but I'm going to have a desert house here shortly. Gotcha. Yeah. It's funny. Cause I was, you know, kind of the opposite yeah. of you. I was out there, you know, born and raised over here in the East coast, did the Vegas thing, actually Portland, Oregon, not far from Washington uh -huh. state, right. You know, down Southern Cal for a year. And then nine years we did in Vegas before we hopped back this way. And now we're actually looking similarly. We're looking to probably do Texas. Okay. Right? The Dallas area. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking right. I'm actually going to fly out there maybe this week or next week and look at a few different areas nice. down towards the Gulf Gulf. Um, in the Houston area around Austin, I'm, I'm pretty familiar. And then maybe in the Dallas Fort Worth area. So those are kind of the, the hit list right now. Dude, we um, loved, we loved Frisco, like North Dallas, man, we loved it out there. Almost, almost got a property out there. It's beautiful. Beautiful. That's yeah. we're looking for space. I'm looking for a ranch where I can raise my kids in an amazing community, right? That's really right. all that matters now. Love that. All right, cool. Well, growing up, let, let's get into the household. So, you know, you, you bounce around born in Washington, but you move back this way. So what was your early childhood like? What were you like as a child? Kind of like, you know, even like the preschool years, what was it like inside your house? And then, you know, kind of how were you developing as a young man? You know, it's funny, man. Uh, and, I, and obviously being here, a lot of what I think about is nutritional context. I, I grew up in what I would define as the all American household. And, and I don't say that in a good way. Um, we we ate way too much we ate all processed foods um you know if you would have asked my mother what a protein source was she would have probably said like chicken tenders um you know mac and cheese like every single day of my life um yeah. and you know i i didn't have any I, I certainly didn't have the genetics to be super overweight because trust me man like what i ate I, I should have been super overweight but um I, I also wasn't naturally like lean either. Right. Um, I grew up as an athlete, so, you know, I played soccer my whole life. Uh, that's, that was my goal. I mean, that was my dream was to, to play soccer professionally. Um, 
I got to play for the U.S. Uh, in 2000. We played in the Harlem Cup over in Holland. And it was actually that tournament that I ended my career. I was like, I'm just not good enough. I'm not big enough. I'm not physical enough. Um, you know, I had this, I had the ball skills, I had the vision, but when I went over there, man, those guys are on another level. And, uh, so it was that time that I actually, I switched over to golf, um, uh-huh. I picked up golf at 14. So I, uh, I dude, I was pretty good, man. By 2002, I was one of the top ranked amateurs in the world and, um, got actually ended up getting hurt right around that time. Uh, and you know, it's, it's kind of oxymoronic to say I got hurt playing golf, but um, uh, my assumption is that we were probably just doing some things wrong. And um, But I went in anyway for like a strength session and I, I literally, dude, I got pinned under like a 95 pound bench. Like I just couldn't move my shoulder. So I had a, I had a slap tear in my labrum. Okay. Um, and that was the first time I ever worked out. Like literally found myself in like the rehab setting. And um, for most people, that'd be a really good thing. Uh, for me, it actually began manifesting a body image issue. Um, and, and so, you know, here I was this all American kid that ate virtually anything he wanted, never had body image issues. I mean, man, I, I just, I loved life like growing up and all of a sudden, um, I really became obsessed and, you know, a couple things like went into that. Like I, you know, um, and we can get deeper into it if you, if you want to. Um, but absolutely. Yeah. So like right at that time I got asked to model, um, for Abercrombie and Fitch. And so, you know, I remember vividly as I was leaving the store that day, they said, make sure you send pictures of your abs. Right. Well, dude, I'm sure you can guess like chicken tenders, bacon, cheeseburgers, milkshakes, mac and cheese. Like I didn't have abs, bro. (laughs) Um, and, and so I was like, okay, so I'm like on this quest to get abs and I've been doing this rehab thing. Right. So I've been in the gym and all of a sudden, and, and this is where I think uh, this is probably why I'm so adamant about our industry. One of my friend's dad, we're, we're at a Friday night football game and he walks by me and he's like, oh, he goes, I can see you've been working out. He's like, you're losing some of that fat. Bro, like when I say those words pierced me, yeah. I mean, I could paint vividly the picture of where we were at the high school, the temperature outside. I mean, I, I could recreate the whole scene because it's still to this day like yep. those words, like they hit me like a ton of bricks. And I'm like, wait, I'm fat. And so now I'm in a rehab setting. I know nothing about fitness. I've been called fat. I've been told I have to get abs and I know nothing about nutrition. Nothing. I don't know. You're mid teens, 15, 16, I'm, I'm 18, 18. Okay. Yep. And so I'm asking everybody, how do you get abs? How do you get abs? And it was, uh, I don't, you know, our pediatrician was a really good family friend. Um, yep. still a good friend to this day, actually. And, and he said, dude, it's all nutrition. Read the, you know, read the articles in the magazines, tell you what to eat. And uh, he's like, you'll have no problems. I was like, cool. Okay. So I started grabbing everything. Uh, I might be a little OCD. And I went and got like muscle and fitness and flex and Ironman and muscle mag and like MD, like all yeah. the stuff back in the day. Right. And I'm reading it. And all I'm reading is don't eat this. Don't eat that. Don't eat this. Don't eat that. And so before I knew it, man, inside of six months, I was doing two hours of cardio a day and I was eating probably less than 800 calories a day. And I'm sure you can begin to imagine what that did to an 18 year old, uh, destroy my hormone levels, full blown anorexia, um, you know, created real, like real life depression, um, and to be completely frank, um, also took me to a place of becoming suicidal. Um, it was that point in my life where every single night I would sit on the floor of my bedroom, my parents' house, and I would contemplate killing myself because I, I didn't want to go through this for another, you know, 60, 70 years. Um, and, and dude, that was, that was rock bottom. And, and that was, that's honestly, if you ask me to like define my, my high school years, that's what I remember the most. I mean, I was a fun loving kid up until then. Um, you know, I went to every party and, I was, I was very like well respected and, and socially I had all the friends and, you know, there was, there's nothing negative, but that's how I kind of define that point, man. And, um, you know, I think though, a lot of times like we're, we're, things are put in our lives because we are, we're able to move through them. And, you know, fortunately I'm, I'm here today because I moved through that. Um, but dude, you want to talk about childhood, man, that was it. It's like two complete polar opposites. Like I, I grew up in, in just a, a household that knew absolutely nothing. 
And then I went to an industry that, and, and I think you and I are so aligned on this, the information that comes out of the industry is so misleading in so many ways, um, so incomplete in so many ways. I was the epitome of what it was doing to people, man, anorexic uh, and suicidal and, and not saying people get to that extreme, but it, it hurts a lot of people, dude. And, and I think that's why you and I do what we do is to go out there and to help people and to eradicate this misinformation and, and to really give people resources that that they can be using to change their lives positively because today we both live a life that is positively changed because of health and fitness. Um, so that's, that's how I remember it all, man. That's, that's like low point 19 years old, bro. That's awesome. And I, I appreciate you sharing that. I, I want to talk in a moment about how you did overcome that. And before we get to that, just very briefly, and I do ask this to all of our guests, was your house, was it a two parent household? Was your mom and dad there? They were both working, like they're both living. Like what was that? Just the general dynamic inside the home. Yeah, man. Um, I grew up in a very loving household, dude. Um, both parents home, uh, you know, parents are still married to this day. Um, awesome. you know, God bless my, my mom's getting ready to, to lose my dad. Um, but yeah, man, uh, very loving household, very supportive household. Uh, you know, I, I knew nothing about finances or anything like that growing up, but knowing what I know now, I look back, I have parents that were literally willing to stretch their means to give me every opportunity. Um, and, you know, I'm probably more thankful and, and more grateful than, than ever because I, I really understand the sacrifices that they made. Um, I, I can't tell you the importance of of coming from that because I look around at some of my, my friends at the time and, and some more disjointed households and, you know, opportunities that they did not have. Um, all of my friends that are in you know good places today came from good families, and uh, it's it's really cool to see. And you know, obviously, I've got a four year old daughter. I know you're super close with your family, and um, you know, it's it's everything to me, man. Uh, my daughter's literally in the next room right now, just hanging out. And, um, it's it's everything, dude. I everything I do in my life is to set her up for opportunity to to live a fantastic life, however however she defines that. Beautiful. Now. It's very interesting. And I, I think it's it's helpful for those listening right now because we, we all go through our own struggles and they feel internal and it's only me. I'm the only one suffering. I'm sure your friends looked at you and said, Jason's a cool guy. He's always fun to be around. He's, you know, the center of attention at all the parties. Good looking dude. He's got Abercrombie wants him the model for Jesus. He's got it said. He's got an amazing family. He's fully loved from the outside. But inside your home, you're sitting on your bedroom floor as a late teen contemplating suicide. That's powerful, man. And we all go through this. And, and, and people listening right now and who will hear this in the future, they're going through their own struggle. If you can share your own experience of how, how you dealt with that, was there a catalyst moment that you actually shook that off? Or was it a slow transition back to health again if, if you can share with us yeah um so there's two sides i mean one i think so much of that was driven like you said on the outside looking in in high school i had it all i was i was good at sports i started varsity soccer early you know i i was i, I mean i was one of the best golfers in the state by 2002 like everything i picked up and i tried i was reasonably good at um, and, but I never like, I never had this like crazy level of fulfillment, like looking back on it, I never did. And, and I think that's why when I got hurt and I was in this setting where, oh, I can be a model. Oh, like I, I started transcending that into, oh, well, guys will respect me more. Oh, women will like me more. And I had this massive level of insecurity inside of myself that this all of a sudden was going to fix. Yeah. Um, I know that today, right? 37 years old, like looking back, clearly I didn't have that point of view then, but yeah you know, I had this crazy level of insecurity and this crazy need for validation from others. And so ironically, as I got deeper and deeper into it, I, I became more and more socially isolated, which led me to the suicidal thoughts. Like I'll never forget. There was a girl that I wanted to date. And as I was like getting leaner and I use leaner in air quotes because also like skinnier, um, yeah. I really was just getting skinny as hell. Um, you know, she, for whatever reason, she like wanted to hang out with me and I kept pushing her away. And she's like, I don't get it. Like you said, you want to date me. And like, now you have this opportunity. And I, and I was so, I was so unhappy with myself all the time yeah. that I pushed away everyone. And, and when I say at that time in my life, I had no friends left. I had no friends. 
because everyone's like, why don't you hang out? Like you're weird. Like you, you don't want to do anything. And I didn't, I had no zest for life. Like nothing mattered, bro. Like when I say, when I say I needed to take a nap at two o'clock, I mean, if there wasn't a couch, a chair, a bed, I'll lay on the concrete or I'll lay on the fucking cement outside and I'll go right to sleep. Wow. It didn't, it didn't like my hormones were tanked. My, my desire to do anything was gone. I just wanted to be alone and do nothing all the time. I mean, that was, that was rock bottom. And, you know, I would say that I overcame it in two ways, in two stages. Um, the first was I had a job opening up Gold's Gym from 5 a.m. to 11 a.m. every day because it was literally the only job I could work. Uh, like I said, 2 o'clock was my shutoff point. My hormones okay. didn't work past 2. So if it required me to be awake past 2 o'clock, I couldn't do it. So Gold's was it. That was it. Um, one of the trainers saw what I was doing. And she, there was this bodybuilder that would come in every day. And I would, I would see him and I was like, man, I, I want to look like him. He was prepping for a show. He was jacked. He was lean. You know, he had all the, all the aspects I wanted. And she said, well, I help him. I do his nutrition. I do his training. And I was like, can you tell me how to do it? And she was like, yeah. And, and she said, I want you to eat 4,000 calories. Wow. And I was like, right. Like, <laughs> I was like, okay. I was like, cool. And dude, this is 2002. 2002, 2003. And so this is long before my fitness pal. And so I went to Barnes and Noble and I got a calorie counting book and, and I wrote out 4,000 calorie meal plans. Yeah. And I never forget. I looked in the mirror three weeks later as I was opening up the gym, you know, opening up the locker rooms. I, I look in the mirror. I'm like, hey, I'm not fat. And I was like, this, this food thing's not that bad. Had you been carrying that I'm fat oh, yeah. title in your head since your friend's father had said that years before? Oh a hundred percent like to the point to where i'll i'll never forget and there's certain things i think that always stick out right yeah. i'll never forget i had seen a nutrition a registered dietitian that had told me cheese and crackers was a good snack and and so i did that and i was on my way to one of the many jobs that i failed which was best buy and i'll never forget i'm pulling in the parking lot for whatever reason i'm sitting like i am now like in a seat and like i felt like there was a, a skin roll or a fat roll over my shorts and i'll never forget berating myself and I'm like, why would you eat something like that? You know, that's bad for you. You yeah. fat piece of shit. And I'm literally going off on myself in the car. And, and just like, it, that was, that was my day to day life. And so, you know, when I overcame the food part and I ate the 4,000 calories, I was like, man, I, uh, I'm not fat. This is cool. But that was stage one. I think there was a lot of stages because sure. I really only trusted food that I controlled. Right. I was. I was cooking it all. I, I was putting it all together, but I wasn't living like a normal 19 year old kid. Let's be honest. Right. I was living at my parents' house. I was working five to 11. I would go back in the afternoon for a workout. Like is what it is. So I, I decide that I really want to get into this and I want to transfer to Florida state, get my degree, exercise science, fitness, nutrition. And, and so I do. And I moved down there. Well, now I had to learn life in a slightly less controlled setting. Because I was like, well, I want to be a normal 20, 20, 21 year old kid. Yep. Well, that means go to parties, drink alcohol. And bro, I'll never forget the first night I drank alcohol. I woke up the next morning and I told myself, I'm going to be fat. And I ran to the mirror and I looked in the mirror and I was like, holy shit, I'm not fat. So and hydrated. You're probably I was, leaner. Yeah, I was actually probably a little leaner, right? right. <laughs> but I, uh, I did this with everything, man. The first night I had pizza. After that, okay. I woke up the next day and I was like, I'm going to be fat. And I ran to the mirror and I looked and I was like, hey, I'm not fat. Chipotle, pizza, sandwich, like subs, like Subway, like you name it, like normal things that people would eat. Yeah. I had to relearn and recreate, you know, a level of trust that these things in moderation could be in my life. And, and so that was stage two. And then I think there was a third stage, which if I'm being completely honest, it's probably been in the last five to seven years. Um, I'm 37 years old. Yep. And so until I really got to my thirties, I don't really ever think I understood why that existed in my life. I thought that it was a food issue. I thought it was a mindset issue around the way that I looked. Um, but I was never able to get introspective enough to really understood or to really understand my lack of self-awareness, my need for validation. Um, and, and the other things, and, and the crazy part was up until I was 29, 30, I wasn't very successful in my life either. Ironically, as I became more aware and I understood the drivers behind those negative behaviors, then 
I started to realize they were the same drivers behind the negative behavior I had in my late twenties, which kept me from being successful. Yep. And in the last seven years, I've built the empire that I have now, right? We built a consulting business that did $3 million that we exited two years ago. Yep. Um, we built NCI and BCI that we currently have. That is, you know, an eight figure company, um, where lots of people are now asking to come work for us. And we even have acquisition offers. And, and it's, so there was, there's three very definitive stages, man. And I think so many people look at like the behavior of consuming food and, and, and I'm very big on, yes, obviously you need to change that behavior, but you need to ask yourself why you haven't been able to change the behavior. I, I spoke to a bunch of nutrition coaches last week and I said, you do realize none of us should have a job, right? None of us should have a job. There is all the information on physiology, metabolism, biology, nutritional science. It's all on Google. It's all in textbooks. It's all in courses. Yet people still fuck it up. Yeah. Yet obesity is still rising. Yeah. And and to to make it worse, our understanding of those principles is also at an all time high. Yet obesity is still rising. Yeah. We just went into lockdown where we should have been able to control all the variables in our lives, and yet we got worse and worse. And so it's like, why are we not taking the actions we should be taking? And that was like literally when everything came full circle for me. And and honestly. That's what's put me at this spot where I am today. And I feel like I'm really at the best spot in my life. And now let me ask you on that. Why is obesity rising? Why are people less healthy today than they were yesterday as a population, as a culture, when we have access to more information, more relevant evidence-based information also, and we know what doesn't work. And I want to talk to you later about the exclusionary restrictive fad dietary practices that we know don't work, but boy, they make great SEO hashtags and they're certainly amazing for Facebook pixels to to chase around, right? You and I understand all that pisses me off, by the way. But if we know everything and we have access to everything, you and I, we shouldn't have a job. Right. I should, we should more be cheerleaders clapping for everyone we know because they're all in amazing shape. But you and I, we're busier than ever. And, and those like us, we are busier than ever because three out of four adults are overweight or obese, up from 60%, up from 50%. So why is this? Access to this information, what would you say is, is the catalyst? What's the problem here? There's, there's so many, man. Um, there's marketing is a big problem. And, and I love marketing. Because I, I look at, you know, it's a double-edged sword. I think that the best coaches in the world have to learn to market so they can go out and get more clients and do the right, excuse me, do the right thing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not sexy to, to do the right thing. You know, you and I could sit here and we could talk about all the right things to do. Eat high quality, nutrient dense foods, you know, move a little bit more. Um, you know, we could surmise it to those two things, right? Stay hydrated. We, we could surmise it to those three things. That's not sexy. That's it's too simple. It couldn't be that simple. Yep. Right. So instead, you've got all these, you know, idiots out there creating, well, this protocol will you can, you know, lose this amount in two days, or you can detox here, or you know, all you have to do is, you know, go cool sculpt, you know? Um, yep. and <clears throat> yet there's just so many. I, I think our I think our nation is lazier than ever, to be totally honest. Yep. Um, and and I think inside of that, we're looking for the quick fix. Um, and, and we have a quick fix mentality. Uh, you know, I think that patience is so underdeveloped in our culture. Um, hmm. you know, and, and I coach a lot of businesses now too, on how to grow to seven and eight figures. And even at, at the top, even the nutrition coaches that are, that are great coaches, sure. they have no patience in their business. And I'm like, man, how are you as a nutrition coach? Because if you can't get your client on board to see a longer game, like, Listen, all of us are equipped to help somebody lose weight quickly. We understand it. Very few are equipped to help people really understand how they did it and how they can maintain that. And, and I've always said, man, like I, I judge coaches in our space. Like I want to see your clients in five years, 10 yeah. years. I, I don't care about your clients in five days, five weeks, five months. Like that doesn't excite me that much. Is it, it, you know, any dickhead can, can starve you one time. It completely disregards your metabolism uh, disregard your hormonal profile and and say, oh, well, I got you really late. Like, cool, right? But there's like, and this is what I've always loved about you. You have a 100% success rate, right? Which means when you work with a client and you keep working with them, they continue to be successful. Yeah. Not everybody can say that. And, and there's a longevity component to that. 
I'll actually never forget our last talk, man. You had a very big impact on me, whether you realize it or not. Your your emphasis on longevity um, was it, it did not fall in deaf ears. Um, I'm sure my community loved it, but I loved it. And, you know, as I look at my role in this space now, you know, I was a coach and now I'm a leader of coaches and um, I need to be around a lot longer because I, I feel like we're doing things that are that are needed in the industry. And that means that we have to be treating ourselves well. Um, and that, yeah, listen, as an entrepreneur and as as a, as a coach that, you know, sometimes just fell into bad habits, I didn't always prioritize that, man. And so I think that um, it's, it's very easy to fall into bad habits. Western culture makes it very easy. I mean, shit, dude, we could drive down the street, both, you know, where you're at and where I'm at, and, you know, food's a dollar and, uh, you know, there's a dollar menu, there's $2 menu, there's probably a five cent menu. Um, you know, every, fa- every drive through is probably packed out to the main roads, but Hey, why not? You know, we'll wait in that line to get what we do. Um, everything is sensationalized. Everything's artificial. Um, it, it's all easy, man. And, and so anything that. Anything that becomes remotely difficult, we shy away from it. And I'm not quite sure why, when that happened, why that happened, but uh, it's definitely causing a lot of issues. Absolutely. And it's, I think you hit it on the head in that people just want what's easy. They want what's easy right now. And most people, in my experience, right, they don't think about tomorrow as much or the long term or how today's decisions will impact them down the road, whether that's, you know, speaking, losing their patience with a child and missing a, an educational opportunity, right? Just shoving a tablet in front of their kid's face instead of taking the few moments to correct them in a meaningful contextual way to then build them into a better young adult, teenager young you know human as they continue on through life right they, they miss that or nutritionally speaking right they miss those opportunities of delayed gratification we love delayed gra- gratification here we speak about it all the time and I, I talk about a kit kat story where i man i love kit kats i grew up on kit kats like like you i you know grew up eating you know getting trying to save 25 cents to buy a piece of candy and that was yeah. the big treat and then in time as a grown man i had the access to eat a kit kat but i was training and I kept it next to my bed. And every day I said, you know what? I'm going to eat that after I train hard today. And I'm going to eat that after dinner. I'll eat that tomorrow with a cup of coffee. And I kept putting it back. And over the period of time, about six weeks or so, and this was accidental. So it's not like I had some brilliant thought. I just, I just kept, let me just push it a little further, a little further. And I would look forward to it when it was time to eat it. You know, I'll do it in a little while. Let me take a shower first. So by the time that six weeks was done, I threw it in the garbage. And I never had that craving again. I was simply able to, and I was just self mastery. I was just able to overcome myself, right? And usually, I ate the Kit Kat because I was sad. I was sad. I was lonely. I was I was made fun of. I was bullied, like as a kid, which is why you know, similar to a lot of similarities, and all of us have these. It made me feel better short term. Long term, made me feel worse. And I kind of stumbled onto that as as a young uh, adult, and it was a formative moment for me to help teach other people going through their own issue in life so when you are faced with the food choice you know it's like like lee Sai, and i you know i don't often call people out but lee, lee Sai, gary v's you know per, former personal trainer i don't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy i don't know if he's a good coach or a bad coach but i know his information is not good because he kind of prides himself in go ahead and eat the cookie and eat the snickers bar and have the burger and just one won't kill you but that's wrong because it's never just one and we must have the ability to say, no, I'm going to defer that gratification down the road. I, now, if you eat the one piece of cookie, no, it doesn't make you a POS or a bad person, but it does mean you made a mistake. You it did fall, right? You, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. Here's here's the thing that I love about that. That's so counterculture because it's not nice. Yeah. Right? And, and so when I look at the state of the internet, and the internet has obviously made our, in, our industry way worse. Um, it's, it's given us more accessibility, which I think is good, but it's made us way worse. Yeah. People want to be told it's okay. Absolutely. They want to be coddled and, and they don't want discipline. And, you know, I, I had a, I did a training last night. I wore a shirt that said, do the boring work. Right. And, and I think we could probably have a shirt that says do the hard work, but it's not easy. Like as somebody that was anorexic, and, you know, today, like, honestly, even extreme, like if I had to get, 
I want to do a YouTube video on making a cut to like welterweight, right? Like just for fun. Yep. But I feel like it would trigger really negative behaviors for me relative to my past. And so like, I'm very scared of it. Yeah. I want to do it solely for that reason, because I want to fight those demons. Yeah. Making a cut is not that hard, right? Following a diet's not that hard. I'm pretty, I'm pretty regimented. I mean, anorexia taught me how to be regimented, but I want to fight those demons. I want to go head to head with them. People don't want that fight. That's People good. don't want the fight of like reality showing up. And you know, you and I, we could do, we could, here's a Big Mac, here's a salad. Which one's healthier? Both, both available at McDonald's, by the way. Sure. Which one's healthier? We all know the salad. Why are more people choosing a Big Mac? What, like, like, let me follow you around with a camera. And the next day, when you get on the scale and you're pissed off that the scale is higher, let me show you a recap of the choices you yeah. made yesterday. Not the gun to your head, somebody forcing bad food down your throat. The active choices that you made. The participation in your own misery. And nobody wants that, man. And so I love that notion. I love the notion of telling people like, hey, if you're on something and you're not supposed to have it, you're not supposed to have it. Like the end. Excellent. Now let's kind of move down the road a little bit. A brief overview. If you had to give a a knee jerk bullet point list, what are the most important nutrition principles everyone should be following? relative to whatever then they make different skill sets i don't care about the marathon runner or the power lifter what are the general principles the average person should be focused on to be living living better longer that's kind of one of the mantras we we use here what would you say i think i think three things come to mind for me yep first is you need to be able to sustain whatever you're doing if, if what you're doing is temporary you're asking yourself for the the perpetual yo-yo that you've been on your entire life and so now there's there's a lot there, that's a very open ended statement, but it needs to be somewhat sustainable for your whole life. The second is dietary protein. We understand dietary protein, the pres- the preservation of lean tissue over the course of your life is going to preserve your metabolic rate. It's going to guard you against all of the things that you're go- eventually going to age into. Um, and then the third is a heavy emphasis on micros, man. Um, eating high quality nutrient dense foods and the emphasis on those because here's the thing: if what you're doing is sustainable. If you're eating adequate protein and you're emphasizing micros at every meal, there is zero chance that you're over consuming the bad shit. You just have satiety to a level that you don't want the bad shit. You're actually feeling good, unlike most humans, because you're eating the right amount of good stuff. And so this is a, a conversation completely independent of quantity. Because we're putting the emphasis on quality. I believe at that point for 90% of people, the right quantity will solve itself. Now, you want to talk about like bodybuilders getting ready for a show. You want to talk about making weight. Do we need to understand macros to a degree? Sure, right? Do we need to understand quantity to a degree? Of course. But most people are never cutting for a UFC fight. Most people are never getting on a bodybuilding stage. Most people are not trying to do anything at that level. And we're the industry as a whole is extracting principles from those extremes and trying to apply it to general population, which I think is completely flawed. Absolutely. And like you and I, we grew up with the bodybuilding magazines. I used to wait till every Tuesday or every Thursday for the new <laughs> flesh, <too>. right? <laughs> I knew which I knew which week each magazine came out. I was so exactly. excited. Exactly, which is awesome. But that's the way we came up. I, mean, I remember riding my bike to the library to learn just like you about nutrition. I mean, could I couldn't imagine if I had access to the internet back in those days, Jesus, right? Never would have left my room. And that's for other reasons too, by the way. Um, So when we talk about the fitness industry, what are your thoughts on the current state of the Insta coach? You get this, this attractive woman or this handsome man with these great bodies. And it's like, Hey, I just did my first competition. DM me for personal diets, private diets. And there's, there's these beautiful people with millions of followers, right? One just got busted down there in Texas. I I don't know if you saw Pretty Dawn just got busted. That's the one selling these uh, acting like, like what she overcame an eating disorder. So she was something along those lines. And you know, don't quote me on it, but she was falsifying, allegedly falsifying personalized programs for people with specific health conditions which shows you how scary this stuff is, but also just the average individual on Instagram right now who's cranking through these bodybuilder.com Google-based downloadable templates, pushing them out to their population, but they're inferring an expertise that they do not have. And I say that there's a very clear distinction between a fitness marketer and a fitness expert. 
Unfortunately, the fitness experts are pushed out of the algorithm by the fitness marketers who are really damn good at marketing their widget. But many of them, it's every 18 to 36 months on average, as the SEO keywords change, so does their entire nutrition philosophy. Yeah. And that's an easy tell. So we tell our audience, go look two years ago and see what they were selling you. If it is not near identical to what they're talking now, if there was an evolutionary trend maybe in what they're saying, great. But if they were selling you keto and now it's Insta or, or intermittent fasting or now it's carnivore, but it used to be paleo, yeah. like, do they really know what the F they're talking about or are they just trying to convert you, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's an, it's a problem. Um, you know, obviously I own a certification company and, you, you know, on top of that, we have a business development company. And to my knowledge, we're one of the, we might be the only business development company that says, here's a foundational level of things that you have to be able to show us before we'll actually teach you how to make money. Wow. And wow. the reason for that is I'm not going to put coaches into the space and teach them to make money unless they're high quality practitioners. And one of those things, you have to be able to show us 10 high quality pieces of social proof, right? Now, if you haven't gotten there, we'll help you. We can help you create that, right? We'll help guide you how, through how to do that. Um, but you have to be able to show social proof, man. You know, it's it's a gift and a curse where we're at. You know, the, the gift is accessibility. The curse is accessibility. And, you know, I, I think that I've always said the most intelligent nutrition coach is somebody that none of us know about. Because they're so good at their craft and they just suck at marketing. Yeah. And and that's really sad. Um, and and chances are, like, I, I mean, I won't go into names, but there's some very big companies out there that are horrible. Um, I mean, I've I've ordered their stuff just to see what it is. Because I'm like, if you guys are making that much money, I want to see what you guys are doing that's that much different than anyone else. And I'm like, this is garbage. Yeah. Um, it's scary. And, and the truth is, I don't want it regulated because the government involvement, in anything never ends up good. So I, I don't want the government to come into our industry, Yeah. but, but there needs to be some sort of regulation, right? Like there's this catch 22 that's going on. Um, I, I think that there just needs to be more education. And, and I think that guys like you and I need to be willing to call out the, the people that are doing it wrong and not be afraid to have those conversations. And, um, and talk about what's right in, in the process and, you know, all of those things. Yeah. And I hear a little, you little hear my, baby. My little. princess is in here. She's coming in to say hi. I'm sweaty. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, take your time. You got to talk to the little one, brother. Feel free. It's Absolutely. always. Absolutely. Sweaty. Okay, baby. Daddy be right with you. Okay. Right, awesome. be good. Okay. So on that note, are there any individuals, names, like people or companies that you do want to call out that you feel are egregious? What they're putting out there is bad information. It's wrong information. They're taking advantage of the population. I don't want to start internet wars, um, but I think anybody that is claiming Anybody that's claiming that they, that it's a, a, you know, that there's no amount of individual individualization needed and they're only marketing their own body, this should be a red flag. Yeah. Right. And so the, I think you nailed it. All the physique competitors that are literally finishing their show and they're like, if you want the diet that got this, Hey, you want to sell me that plan so we can study how you achieve those things. Cool. Like yeah. fair play. I enjoy yeah. that. Right. But at the same token, you can't tell me that that's going to work for absolutely everybody. Are you yeah. saying hi now? Hi, that's sweetheart. You say hi to Mr. Mike. Hi. <laughs> we put this on as soon as daddy's done. Okay. Wait, five, wait, 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you, baby. So I, I think that anybody that is selling their own personal plan as the solution to somebody else's, dude, we could go names all day long. Um, there's, there's tons of them. You know, the other, the other thing is there's these app companies now that are like, well, I'll just, I'll build you an app. And they go to these influencers and they're like, well, I'll just build you an app, put your exercise in here and I'll do all the marketing and sell it for you. Yep. And we know that's garbage too. So, yep. um, I mean, scroll Instagram and take your pick. <laughs> they're, they're all over the place. Yeah, true. No, it's, and there, there's, there are a lot of names out there and it, it's some of which I'm sure you and I know, cause I, it's like, dude, I knew you three years ago. 
I knew you six years ago. I know what you were selling then and what you were saying. Now I see what you're saying now. I call them, you know, keyword flippers. They just jump onto the next keyword. They go all in. They're the foremost expert on whatever is trending on Google right now. And they're just throwing up different, you know, they're just popping the keywords up there. That is the most dangerous of coaches because they infer this level of expertise that they do not have. And I say they have a clear, they're either very low in ethics, which you never want to do business, especially trusting an unethical individual with your health, right? There are serious negative health outcome outcomes, which following the wrong program, the wrong person on the wrong program, serious, right? I mean, that's kind of what got me into all this was, you know, it's ironically one of the magazines I started reading when I first got in was, was like men's health and men's fitness. Yep. And when I finally overcame everything and I had some notoriety in the industry, I was asked to write for men's fitness. And I thought that was like literally coming full circle yeah. because I was like, your articles are the ones that played some level of responsibility in sending me into anorexia. Yeah. And I want to make sure that the articles we put out are not doing that to anybody. And so now I'm not saying that any author writes anything with malice or, or misintent. I, I'm not saying that, but I do think that it's extremely negligent to put out content to make a buck and not consider what is actually like, like what might happen from these things. Right. Yeah. I, I don't think the intent is ever to hurt, but I, I do think it's extremely negligent. And I think that that is, it's just as bad to be honest. I mean, shit, if we went to the, if we went to the, the courthouse and we studied law you know negligence inside of killing somebody is still killing somebody yeah and and you're still going to go to jail and so these people need to understand they're still in in a way in my opinion committing a crime yeah. and and i think that it's just it's not discussed enough it's swept under the rug and, and dude i'm sure you experienced this you know we had our coaching company um my best lead source was other really awful coaches Absolutely. Because people would go to them and they'd be like, um, you know, and, and they're oftentimes very cheap. Yeah. And then they would come to me and they would finally pay the fee. And they'd be like, wow, I understand why you charge more money. And, and, and I would have to apologize on their behalf. I'm sorry you're starting in such a bad place. Yeah. You could have been starting in a very positive place, but you went down their rabbit hole. You damaged your metabolism, damaged your hormone profile, your HPA axis. And now we got to fix that. Yeah. And, and so, again, it's... I don't see it getting better anytime soon. That's that's the sad reality. Well, with the power of social media, the power of AI, the power of digital marketing, it's easier for the the shreds of the fitness industry to simply take over. And and those who don't know who shreds is, just check it out. Shreds with a Z. Was that? I said, just Google it. You'll find just it. Google it. You'll see it. And Lord knows how much money they pulled out of the industry before they got caught and folded up. Right. And I forget who the, the they had some, you know, Paige Hathaway, who's, you know, a Paige, fitness, Zoe, Nick, you know, all of them, all of them, man, they, they should be blackballed from the industry, but they just pop up with a new, it's kind of like those, you know, uh, contractors, right. They, they take everyone's money. They never build the deck. They fold, they you know, declare bankruptcy. They fold that company with all the cash and they open up a new LLC or an S corp in your same damn town. Yep. Put a new sticker on the truck. They keep driving around doing the same, same deal. Um, so now I do want to speak about your coaching company. So can you tell us a little bit more now? Cause you, you went through, you, you have the origin story. You started off, you had your own personal issues with health and fitness and figuring out diet and exercise. You went through that. You got the education. You started spreading the information you had. You were training regular folks to be better, to live better, to achieve their healthy eye physical ideals. And then you kind of come to, and there's an arc to that career. Also, you come through that arc and then you get to the point now that you're coaching coaches. So briefly tell me that transition when you stopped coaching as many individual clients and you started coaching the coaches and tell us about your business. Yeah. You know, all I've kind of lived by a code since, since I got in is my own personal code, which is always choose impact over everything. And, and so to me, that meant I'm going to chase impact over any amount of income. I'm going to chase impact over literally anything that I do. If, if I'm not doing it and I can't understand how this is going to make the people around me or the world a better place, I shouldn't be doing it. Yep. And so we built this coaching company. I had 15 coaches working for me. We're crushing it, making lots of money. It's, it's awesome. But I started to see 
there were a lot of coaches struggling and a lot of really intelligent coaches, right? The guys that we already referenced earlier, the ones that are living in obscurity on the internet because they're terrible marketers. Yep. And I saw that they, they had all this talent, all this potential. And I was like, why are they not making it? And so finally, somebody actually approached me and was like, hey, man, will you help me? And I was like, sure, I'll help. And I mean, we, we crushed it for him. He, yep. he blew up. And another coach asked and they blew up and, and yep. it, it started. And I was like, and I started doing the math and I was like, you know, if my, if my company is helping all these people every year and I can help the same number of coaches that then go out and help 500 to a thousand people a piece, dude, impact is at scale. Yeah. And, and so that was really the decision December, uh, I'm sorry, January, 2020, I officially exited my coaching company. Yep. And completely went into the other company. Now we had opened in 2017. That's when the search opened. But I yep. made the very firm decision in January 2020 to to make the switch. And to be completely honest, man, it's been the most gratifying change because I I see coaches that are doing it the right way. They have the desire to have the right amount of change. And and watching them create the freedom for their clients and in their own lives has been amazing. I, yeah. I, I honestly, man, I'm the happiest person I've ever met in my life. That's awesome. Now, tell me a little bit more about your coaching company. I want to share that with everyone here so they can understand a little bit more. This is the Nutritional Coaching Institute. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, so NCI, you know, obviously when you and I came in, there was kind of a, I'll say a blue hexagon company. Uh, that was like the gold standard, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, they were the cert for a long time. And, and listen, man, much love to JB. He did a lot in this industry. Yep. Uh, I He's speaking on my stage in April. Uh, I love the guy. Uh, and, but I, I, I knew something was missing. If there was a lot of coaches in this world that were smart, but still weren't creating results, they still weren't having the success they desired. And I, so I, I asked myself, well, what's missing? What needs to change? What more? And I had a six hour drive from Southern California back to Scottsdale. Yep. But halfway through that drive, man, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, the reason that I succeed as a coach and the reason that others are struggling to succeed as a coach is they're relying purely on knowledge and they have no real world application. Yep. And so I built a whole certification predicated on, we're going to teach you the knowledge, then we're going to teach you the real world application. And that was our level one, right? And so once you go into the level one, then you can get into all the other specialties, the hormone, the mindset, the L2, all of those things. Um, but that is where real success started, man. And when we built an emphasis on just application, hold on one sec, sweetheart. When we built that emphasis on application, it changed the game. And we have people that come to us every single day telling us this was the missing link. This was the missing link because they had the knowledge. They had the desire. They wanted to chase impact. Yeah. They didn't know how to connect to the clients in today's marketplace, in Western culture, the way it is today, and, and actually create results. And that has been it's everything, man. I think application is the game in everything you do. Dude, there's a lot of people that understand nutrition when it comes down to, you know, UFC and cuts. Absolutely. Very, there, there's been nobody that's repeated your success. Yeah. Why? Because they don't get the application and yeah. application is the game. Yeah, man. I love it. Now we'll, we'll link to this below. We'll, we'll make sure we keep pushing um, back for everyone to the nutritional coaching Institute, also to your Instagram, but I wanted to take a couple quick questions from our community yeah. here, Jason, if you don't mind. So dirty Mirtha says, if you are out for the day and stopped for lunch at a sit down place, where is it? And what are you eating? I love this. Um, if available so anywhere farm disabled is going to be my first preference. So I guess it kind of depends what part of the country are you in. You know, if you're out west, like SoCal, you can find that kind of place. Yeah. Um, you know, if right now I'm in Hilton Head, South Carolina. There's You're not going to find that kind of place. Um, man, one of my new favorite places lately is Sweet Greens. Uh, okay. Just get a high-quality salad, load it up with as many ingredients as possible, some high-quality protein in there, and, uh, and and that's been it, man. That Honestly, Sweet Greens, if I can find it, um, and by the way, they have them in Texas, if I can find Sweet Greens, that's, that's my number one jam right now. That's the go-to. And that, that basic farm to table kind of mindset, right? Yeah. It's, you know, I'm trying to get high quality micros in with some protein, man. I mean, that is, that's my mindset every time I eat now, you know, yeah. if, if I'm getting ready to train carbs before and after. Um, but if uh, other than that, man, it's micros and protein. And I, I tell you, like I said, I, I feel good and body's functioning some of the best it's ever been. 
Yeah. I'm hitting the golf ball further than I ever have. So something's working. Bam. Oh, that's awesome. That's I can't hit one at all, man. I'd probably fall <laughs> over. If I try I swing it like a, uh, a baseball bat. Um, let's see here. So YOLO says my ethnicity is from Southern China. Is there a specific food I should eat or avoid? And then he goes on saying, it, you know, eating for blood type or eating for your genes. Do you have any information on that? You know, it's interesting, man. None of the research that I've come across, and, and I, I'm a peer-reviewed guy, no, nothing supports ethnicity or blood type diets. Um, so uh, the question, the second question is probably a little more valid than the first. The second yep. question being, um, you know, eating for your blood type or eating for your ethnicity, it really doesn't hold any merit. Peer-reviewed science doesn't support it. So yep. your first question is, is there any specific foods you should eat often or avoid? You should eat high-quality nutrient-dense foods. You should yep. avoid refined and processed foods, just like everybody else. Yep. That's yeah, I agree with that too. Um, we haven't the same thing. We pour through the data, right? I don't see anything. No, there's, there's nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing. Yep. nothing. Abs and, and any study that has showed marginal support, go look at who funded it, and there was a motive. And yeah. that's and, and you have to look at that when you look at peer-reviewed literature as well. That's true. We got Nick, who's you know very appreciative of your motivational story, which is much awesome. Man. Much love, yeah. man. I appreciate that. Yeah, we got us uh, some. Uh, made way you got some wrestlers i think that's off topic um amir rob great show we appreciate that rob of course bam uh jonathan says what's up coach he's listening to you jason on the mind pump show with the boys it's great um that we share yep jason and i very similar which is of course why he's you know on the show where we get along i'm not gonna <laughs> you, well, maybe, maybe maybe, like a, and it might be good to bring on some of these idiots and let people go at it man it'd be a good time <laughs> You know, probably that would be a good one. And I'm not a drama guy. That's the thing. Right. Like, I feel you. And I, I wouldn't do it, but it would be funny anyway. It would be nice to like have that point counterpoint. Like, all right, you know, you think you know so much. Well, let's flesh this out a little bit. For sure. And, you know, back to the cookie thing. I, I do hang, you know, like I get hung up on that. When is it ever just one cookie though? There, uh, dude, I don't know anybody that's just one cookie. My daughter doesn't just eat one cookie. Do you eat one cookie? Yeah. Do you eat two? How many do you eat? I don't know. Oh, she don't know, but it's more than one. <laughs> oh, more than one. It's all the cookies, right? It's all the cookies. All the cookies daddy gives me. She, she said she likes cookies. No, good. Well, Jason, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. You're there with your beautiful little girl. So we're going to let you go, man. Thank you. Now, everyone can find you at Jason Phillips is nutrition, if I'm saying correct. that correctly. Correct. So yes, at sir. Jason. Uh, what's that? I'm sorry. Oh, said, yes, sir. That's correct. So boom, find you right there. Go to his Instagram page, the Instagram page, everything Jason has got, got going on. Now you have actually, you have an event coming up in April. Briefly, what is that event? So anyone here, if they're interested. We do, April 8th through 10th. It's Coaching Con. Um, you know, there's live events for virtually every uh, profession in the world, except coaches. And I believe coaches change the world. Uh, so we need an event. And, and that's what this is, man. We've got, uh, we've got some heavy hitters coming out. We've got, uh, man, We've got Ed Milet, we've got Alex and Layla Hormozzi, we've got Billy Jean, Ryan Stuman, we've got John Berardi, Rob Bailey, uh, Jay Ferruja, Luca Hosever, Kelsey Heenan. Um, it's, it's a stacked lineup. It's going to be three action-packed days in Scottsdale, Arizona. What a better setting in April. You can't, you can't find one. Um, so, and uh, yeah, you can go. I think it's coachingcon22.com slash ticket is the, is that, is the site. If you can't find it, send me a DM. I'll shoot you a link. Uh, I'll take care of you. But we're, we're excited, man. We're, uh, we're expecting five to 600 people in the desert, and uh, it's going to be a good time. That sounds amazing. And you're right. There, there, there does need to be a coaching event for coaches led by coaches who have already walked the journey, maybe just farther down the road, right? So they can kind of kick that experience and education back to the rest of the room. That's awesome, man. Very exciting event. Super exciting, dude. We got to get you there in 23. Ooh, let's do it, man. I'm in. Sounds like a good time. I love it. All right. Well, Jason, thank you, brother. Thank you so much for being here. I definitely appreciate it. I know everyone here appreciates it. And uh, everyone, go follow Jason. All right, guys. Until next time. Boom. Where's my close out here? Here we go.